You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Kevin Napier. Kevin Napier is a physics PhD candidate at the University of Michigan studying solar system dynamics. He is interested in understanding the details of our solar system formation and evolution. In the context of our own solar system, he combines analytic and computational methods to use known objects as dynamical probes to infer details of the migration of the giant planets. Kevin Napier, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, Kevin, all the rage lately, and for several years now, has been speculation about a possible Planet Nine in the far outer solar system. And to preface this, the 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 idea is based on the juxtaposition of certain very, very far out trans-Neptunian objects. Now, in your recent paper, you point out this could be selection bias and that there may not actually be such a clustering. Could you give us an overview? Yeah, so the extreme trans-Neptunian objects whose purported clustering have led to this Planet Nine hypothesis are on very long, skinny orbits. And that introduces severe selection bias because they are only observable when they're very close to perihelion. So that means that they're very susceptible to the selection bias of where you point your telescope and when you point it there and exactly how sensitive your instrument is at detecting those objects. Now, this apparent clustering, it really looks like it's real because these objects appear to all be clustered up in these variables called the longitude of pericenter and in their orbital poles. But what we did was we ran an analysis in which we corrected for the bias of the surveys that have discovered most of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects. So those are a survey done on multiple telescopes by Scott Shepard and Chad Trujillo, the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, which really set the standard for how to account for your own survey's bias, and the Dark Energy Survey. And between these three surveys, there are between 14 and 16 extreme trans-Neptunian objects. So this is the, the largest sample of objects that anybody has been able to, to study so far while fully accounting for the selection bias of the surveys that detected them. So the way that we accounted for that, that bias was to simulate the surveys themselves. So we generated a synthetic population of 10 billion extreme trans Neptunian objects, and we asked ourselves which which of those objects could these surveys possibly have detected? And that sculpts out something called a selection function. So in each of the six parameters for an orbit, we were able to determine basically a, a probability distribution that an object would be able to be detected by that given survey. And once you've done that, you, have your, you understand the biases of your surveys and then you can compare those, those selection functions, those biases, with the objects that were truly discovered by that survey and see if they're consistent. So if the objects are in some way different than the selection biases of that survey, then there could be something weird going on. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't rule out Planet Nine. It just simply says, look, there may not be as strong of evidence for this as what was thought. Now future surveys would probably make this clearer, correct? Is there anything planned? Yeah, so there are, well, the, the biggest one is the legacy survey of space and time at the Vera Rubin Observatory. That will blow everything else out of the water in terms of the sheer number of extreme trans-Neptunian objects that it detects. But currently ongoing is a, a survey that I'm involved in called the Deep Ecliptic Exploration Project. It's a, it's a little bit smaller of a survey, but it goes very deep. We're We'll probably get to around 27th magnitude, maybe not quite that faint, but we'll really be pushing the limits of what you can do from ground-based telescopes currently. So we're hoping that we will find several more of these objects. 
What size telescope is the, is your survey using? What Give us a characterization of it. It's on the four meter Blanco telescope at the Cerro Tololo in Chile. So now we have a whole bunch of telescopes coming down the pike that are huge. <laughs> and I would imagine that's probably also going to expand on it as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that by far the the best shot that we have of really pinning down this argument is with LSST because of the cadence and the depth of the survey will really be able to get a census of what exactly is out there. Now with LSST, of course, this is useful for, you know, basically making an all sky survey every, what is it, a day and a half, something like that. Now, what's, what's its limitations? I mean, what is it going to be able to see as far as very, very distant trans-Neptunian objects? Is it going to really be able to reach that far out? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure what its single exposure limiting magnitude is, probably something like 23 and a half, 24. But it, the cadence with which it is surveying the sky will really allow us to detect faint objects by tracking back through the data once you've detected something. And you'll be able to really refine their orbits. There's also talk about a planet 10. I don't know if you've you've heard of this or not. It, it, some sort of an odd Kuiper cliff exists that that somebody's written a paper on regarding maybe there's something there that's shepherding it or doing something like that. Any thoughts on that? Is this the paper about sort of a Mars-sized object at about 200 AU? Yeah, that's correct. I was just seeing if you if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, certainly. Well, uh, so let me let me put it this way. There are a lot of unexplained problems in our solar system. One is the apparent clustering of the ETNOs, which, as I showed in my paper, might not actually be a problem. It still could be a problem. They still could actually be clustered. And if so, Planet Nine explains them perfectly. But another problem is that we don't understand the, the very high inclination objects in our solar system. We don't understand how they got there necessarily, because they could have been scattered there during the giant planet migrations, but it's not clear how readily they could have been scattered onto their orbits that they're on. And a, a final problem is the there are some detached objects, such as Sedna and VP113. Its nickname is Biden. It's not clear how their perihelia got so large, 60, 70, 80 AU. And one thing, the, the commonality between all of those problems is that they can be solved by injecting some extra angular momentum into our solar system. So Planet Nine, as, as it's hypothesized, um, is really beautiful and elegant. And it's basically, I don't want to reduce it to anything, but it's basically a reservoir of angular momentum far away in the solar system. Because its period is so long, it only really interacts with the rest of the objects in the solar system on secular timescales. So, so that is very, very long compared to the orbits of the inner planets. And by inner planets, I mean all of the other planets compared to Planet Nine, of course. So it doesn't tend to exchange energy with objects unless they scatter off of it. So what it is exchanging with them often is angular momentum. So you can see objects that are wandering outward in their perihelia, or, or they, get, they could sometimes wander inward and get scattered by the, the giant inner planets. And one really weird thing that this extra angular momentum can do is it can give orbits really high inclinations. They can get so high that they're orbiting in polar orbits 90 degrees, but then they can also be pushed over polar orbits into retrograde. And that's, that's one of the coolest results of the extra angular momentum in the outer solar system from Planet Nine. And that is a problem that it could solve. So on that digression, any, any massive body that is far removed from the solar system will have a significant amount of angular momentum and it will cause strange things to happen. And we need strange explanations for some of the strange things that we see in our solar system. What about options like, and, and this may be a non-starter, I'm just tossing it out there. We occasionally pass by other stars, you know, relatively closely. I think we passed by Scholz's star, you know, in geologic time scales not that long ago. Could that be um, a factor as far as scattering these things? Absolutely. So there are, so passing stars could scatter some of our own solar system's objects, or our solar system could strip off some of the rocks that are orbiting around those passing stars, because there are a lot of rocks orbiting around any given star 
if you go all the way out to their orc clouds. So there's there's a huge reservoir of, of stuff that could get sucked up by our solar system. And it's possible that those those interactions could explain some of the objects that we see. That seems to me to be a treasure trove, because if you've got a population of objects from other star systems that you can go out into the outer solar system and study, that seems to me to be pretty interesting. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that's extremely fascinating. You could study their compositions. Um, any any interstellar objects are are really cool. I had another paper on the archive this week in which we studied the capture of interstellar objects by our own solar system. Did you want me to elaborate on that? or? Absolutely. Okay. So basically what we did was we instantiated a bunch of rocks at basically infinity with speeds between zero and I think 15 kilometers per second. And we shot them toward the sun with some given impact parameter. And we tracked the orbits of these objects. And if they became bound to our solar system, we saved that simulation and we went back to look at it later. Now, of the objects that were actually... So we showed that you do actually capture a lot of objects, and that's not exactly a new result. But what we did was we gave a general form for the cross-section of capturing objects as a function of uh, hyperbolic excess velocity. So when you have that, you can convolve that distribution. You just take an integral of that distribution times the function of velocities that you think are out there, and you can get a mass estimate for how much mass you think that there is in the solar system today that has been captured from interstellar sources. Now, as I recall, there are two candidates, two ex-comets, we think anyway, that might be of interstellar origin. This is separate from objects like Omoma or Borisov, but that there are these two objects that maybe Jupiter sort of manipulated into the solar system and might be of interstellar origin. So could we expect a lot of these objects? I mean, a just a huge population of them, even in, you know, areas on the inner solar system? Uh, it's not clear that they could survive for very long in the inner solar system because the the processes by which they're captured are rather chaotic, right? So, so they need to have close encounters with the giant planets unless they're going slowly enough. If, if objects are going slowly enough, then they're kind of, they're sort of captured by the gross motion of the very center of the solar system as they go through it. But there's a lot going on in the inner solar system, and it turns out that unless an object can get its perihelion to be larger than Saturn or so, it's not very long for this solar system, and it will get scattered out again. Now, there are mechanisms by which things could get caught into resonance, but we haven't found any of those yet. It seems like it's a very rare event to have happen. But to answer your question, it depends on what the retention rate is of these objects, and... Also, it depends on if Planet Nine is out there. So if Planet Nine is not out there, it's very difficult to keep these objects forever for, say, a billion years or the age of the solar system, four billion years. So at most, we would expect probably something like 10 to the minus five Earth masses of interstellar material. That And th that's all captured while our sun is in its birth cluster. Of course, these are all estimates and further study. We need to do further studies to, to really pin down the dynamics but after the sun has moved out of its birth cluster, the frequency with which interstellar rocks are coming through our solar system drastically drops off. So we expect on the order of 10 to the minus 11 Earth masses of interstellar material to be captured post-birth cluster, which is like one five-kilometer rock, something like that. Even still, though, just getting a look at one of those and you know, looking at chemical compositions and things like that could be potentially very important. I mean, there's there's a question within astrobiology about uh, the phosphorus problem, you know, that phosphorus may be scarce in certain areas. And I would think that this might, you know, yield some information on it as far as, you know, just how common that element is in the universe. Now, whether or not Planet Nine exists, we're still entering a sort of a new age with these big telescopes where we can actually look at the solar system in real time and catch interstellar objects as they pass through or study trans-Neptunian objects and things like that. So it seems to me that even if we don't find a planet nine, <laughs> we're going to find something interesting regardless. <laughs> don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, whatever is 
causing the weirdness in our solar system has to be interesting because we don't, we don't know about it yet, right? And that's why we do what we do. We're always asking the next question of, of what is causing it. So other stars passing by are interesting. Like It would be really interesting that by playing CSI solar system, and looking at the rocks that we still have in our solar system today, we could infer that something like that happened in the past. That's really amazing. I love that idea, CSI Solar System. Now, Kevin, on Twitter, the two main proponents of Planet Nine, Constantine Batigan and Mike Brown, have been addressing your paper, and I wanted to give you a chance to sort of rebut anything regarding that. Yeah, so there's been a really good scientific dialogue so far. Um, one of the points of my paper that they've been picking on has been that we only expect the stable ETNOs to be clustered. Now, there's not really a, a consensus yet in the scientific community about which ETNOs are stable because um, there are uncertainties on their orbits, some are interacting with the galactic tides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, the, the stability of the ETNOs will depend on if you include Planet Nine in your simulations or not. Now, but we did include the stable ETNOs that were specified in their review article, the Planet Nine hypothesis, and we found that there was no way that we could rule out the null hypothesis using that data. The null hypothesis being that the ETNOs are distributed uniformly in orbital pole and longitude of pericenter. Another issue that they brought up is this issue of uncertainties. So I think that Mike was saying that our uncertainties were larger than his in his paper. There's really no way to know that because the only way to pin down any true error bars on an analysis like this is using a, a Bayesian analysis. And both my paper and their 2019 paper in which they rule out the null hypothesis at a three sigma effect or something, use frequentist analyses. So you can't put true error bars on that. So as far as we can tell, the biggest source of uncertainty in this analysis is in modeling the selection functions. So we model our selection functions extremely carefully and it turns out that they're statistically indistinguishable from those modeled by our own more complete dark energy survey, survey simulator and the OSO survey simulator. And just comparing our results to their results that they present in their 2019 paper, it looks like our selection functions are more accurate so in that sense, our uncertainty would actually be smaller than theirs. And when you're working with such small samples of objects and when they have such uh, strong selection biases, you really need to make sure that your selection functions are correct. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What? <laughs>